Okay, so we're going to get started for the afternoon talks. Um, we're excited to have uh, Pablo Engler from MIT. He's going to tell us about analytic language correspondence over R. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. And uh, uh, I'm very happy to speak up in this conference. And I like very much the notion of uh, arithmetic uh, quantum field theory. Uh, because uh, I know basically nothing about arithmetic and basically nothing about quantum <laughs> theory, but I still can speak at this point. <laughs> so, so I'm going to talk about my work with Edward Frankel and David Kashgan uh, on uh, analytic Langlands correspondence, and I will focus much uh, mostly on the Archimedean uh, fields and uh, uh, specifically real numbers. Uh, I will also talk about complex numbers, but real numbers case is more complicated and richer, and it exhibits some of the, so the periodic case, which is the most interesting maybe case, is uh, difficult mainly because one of the reasons it's difficult is because periodic fields are very non-algebraically closed, Well, the real numbers is only a little bit non-algebraically closed, but still it exhibits already some features of that, and so that's why this case is interesting, one of the reasons. All right, so, uh, uh, and uh, this is contained in this paper, and some of the things are also in previous papers. Uh, so, uh, so let me first do an overview. So G is going to be a connected reductive group. Uh, uh, G check is going to be the Langlands dual group. So it corresponds to the dual root double. For example, when G is PGLN, G check is SLN. And, X is going to be a smooth projected curve over a field F. So far, I'm not going to specify the field in the overview. Uh, but for example, if F is complex numbers, then this is just going to be a compact Riemann surface. And if F is real numbers, then it's going to be a compact Riemann surface with an anticolomorphic involution tau, which corresponds to the action of the Gabor group of complex numbers over the real numbers on this uh, surface. And then uh, the main uh, geometric object in my talk will be the moduli space of principle G bundles on S, uh, which already was mentioned in many talks. Uh, this is the fundamental object of the Langlands theory. Uh, and so, uh, well, at the moment, I'm going to talk about things very informally. Uh, then I will get more technical. So global Langlands correspondence for function fields, which is what I'm going to be interested in various contexts, arises when you do harmonic analysis on this space. Uh, uh, so which means that I want to diagonalize certain commuting operators uh, which are called Heike operators. They appeared uh, also in yesterday's talks, especially Sasha Branderman. And uh, or in the geometric context, instead of operators, I'm going to have functors. And these are uh, acting on a space, uh, of a certain space of functions or respectively category of sheet on this uh, uh, space bungee of X. And uh, then uh, I want to look at the eigenfunctions or eigensheets for uh, this uh, commuting family uh, of operators and uh, have eigenvalues uh, parameterized by data, which uh, is related to the language dual group G. So that's a very uh, general setup. And uh, then there are three flavors. Uh, there is an, an arithmetic flavor, which, uh, which is the original one, and which was introduced by Langlands in late 1960s. And in this case, F, my ground field, is going to be a finite field. Uh, and theta operators act on the L2 space of uh, bungee of X of F. This is a certain countable but infinite set. So this is like L2 sequences. Uh, this is what's talked about by Sasha Braderman yesterday. And uh, eigenfunctions are parameterized by uh, roughly speaking, uh, local systems on the uh, on the curve uh, with values in uh, uh, G check of C, 
which means, uh, roughly speaking, again, it's not quite right, but you know, roughly, homomorphisms from the uh, eta fundamental group of X into uh, GCF of C. In fact, you should consider a lady, uh, and there's some very, very the lean group, but I'm going to suppress that. Uh, then there is a, a Okay, then there is a, a geometric flavor, which is due to Bailenton and Rinkel, and uh, was developed in 1990s. Uh, and that is uh, the following. Uh, so you have a, a, now a, a local field, uh, and uh, uh, this will uh, fall into two subcases, Archimedean, which is real or complex numbers, which is what I'm mostly going to be talking about, and uh, non-Archimedean, which is positive characteristic, which is uh, just formal run series with finite field coefficients or a finite extension for QP, which is the characteristic zero case, most interesting for number theory. And Hecke operators act in this case on uh, L2 space of this bond G, but in this case, uh, uh, so uh, let me see. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I shouldn't be missing with this. Each, that looks like a double page. It looks like there's some stuff on the right. He scrolls to the right, maybe more. Yeah. Ah, okay. <laughs> ah, all right. Okay, I, I see now. Okay, so, and the previous page, did I miss something? Just wondering. Well, it doesn't matter. Okay. <laughs> Ah. Ah, probably it at that scale, no? Is this too small? Ah, all right. No, no, no. I, I, okay, I, I figured it out. Hit command to this <laughs> preview. Please say that it's in that scale. All right. So, so there, uh, 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 so for, uh, the uh, geometric Langlands correspondence, I, I, I skipped something. So for the geometric Langlands correspondence, there are uh, two variants. Uh, so there is a first variant where uh, F equals to C, and uh, KK functors, in this case, act on the derived category of uh, D modules on uh, bungee uh, or uh, constructible sheaves uh, with complex, let's say, coefficients on bungee. Uh, and eigen functions, or in this case, eigen objects, are parameterized by eigen values, which in this case are also objects of some category. More precisely, they are G check local systems on F. So as before, homomorphisms brought from pi one of F to G check of C, but in this case, it is just a uh, topological fundamental uh, group. And uh, then there is a second variant uh, when F is any field, and Hecke functors act on the derived category of sheaves, uh, constructible sheaves on uh, bungee uh, with LA coefficients, uh, and uh, this is parameterized by uh, the eigen uh, objects and uh, parameterized by eigenvalues, which are LA, which are local systems on X. Right. Like and finally, the third setting, is uh, the setting of analytic language correspondence. This was briefly mentioned by Sasha yesterday. Uh, this was the latest to be developed. It started with the work of Sasha with David Kanda uh, in 2007, where they defined take characters or local field. There was a paper of Kansage, which is called uh, Motives in a Positive Characteristic, where there was also a discussion of such operators at about the same time, a little bit later. Uh, and uh, then later in already 10 years later, there were works of some physicists, Jörg Tetzner, uh, Nikita Nikrasov, 
And uh, also Leibniz himself wrote a paper where he, uh, it was in, written in Russian, and he expressed a wish that there should be an analytic uh, counterpart of geometric language correspondence when instead of D-modules, we would be considering resolutions of the corresponding differential equations. So this was to a large extent realized in Teschner's work, but then uh, more systematically, uh, it was developed in our joint work with Edward Frankel, David Kankan. There are already four papers about this. And then in the physics literature, it was, uh, was addressed uh, by Georg and Witten, who followed up on the work of Kapustin Witten on the relationship between geometric language and four dimensional gauge theory. And uh, they uh, adapted it to the uh, analytic flavor of the Langlands correspondence. So let me try to explain what this is all about. So let's see. Uh, okay. So let me just. Actually, in the presentation series, we used to think that symmetry helps solving a problem, but apparently uh, it also harms something. All right, so. Uh, all right, so then. Um, Uh, so in uh, analytic language, uh, we work with a local P, uh, and uh, Hecke operators uh, act on L2 space of band G of M. But uh, uh, now, uh, this is no longer a discrete set, but rather a manifold, uh, well, generically at least, uh, over local field, analytic manifold. Uh, and uh, as such, I explained yesterday, uh, we have to, uh, well, we don't want to put a member on it because there is no natural measure. So the only way to define the L2 space in this case is to uh, consider one half densities on the some open part of the sink, uh, which is uh, 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 stable or very stable bundles. They exist uh, if uh, under some conditions like genus of X, is bigger or equal to two, or uh, if there are punctures, the number of punctures should be sufficiently large. Uh, and then uh, you can define it. And the idea is that this is a complicated stack, and uh, uh, but somehow you you say that generic bundles are uh, stable or very stable, and uh, then uh, you ignore everything else as a set of measure zero. Of course, you have to pay for it later because this geometry of this stack is fundamental to the whole Langlands program. Uh, but uh, to set up the theory, you can uh, at first step ignore them. Okay, and so uh, so in this case, uh, we only know how to parameterize eigenvectors by G-check data uh, in the Archimedean case. Uh, and in this case, uh, eigenvectors are parameterized by G check authors uh, on X, which are local systems with a certain uh, underlying uh, principle bundle. I will say a word about this later. And uh, these authors should satisfy appropriate topological reality conditions. So this connection uh, uh, that will parameterize uh, eigenfunction is uh, going to be subject to two conditions. One condition that it is an author, which means that the underlying holomorphic bundle is a certain particular bundle induced from the principle SL2 base. And the other condition, so that condition exists in the Durham world, but the other condition exists in the Betty world, and it's a condition, it's a topological condition. It basically is a condition on the monodromy of this author, of this connection. Okay, and so these uh, uh, three flavors are uh, interrelated in uh, several different ways. Uh, so let me show this diagram here. Uh, so, uh, well, so here is uh, arithmetic language, analytic language, which is split into two subcases, non-Archimedean and Archimedean. Uh, 
then there is geometric uh, Langlands, uh, which is split into basically three subcases. You can consider D modules, we will consider uh, sheaves of uh, uh, complex vector spaces, or we can consider QL bar sheaves. Um, and uh, they, these, uh, there is also quantum field theory, more precisely, uh, four dimensional uh, uh, supersymmetric gauge theory of a certain uh, uh, kind, and uh, topological twists. Uh, uh, and so, uh, how are they related? So, first of all, uh, there is a map from arithmetic to uh, analytic, which was discussed by Sasha yesterday, that you can lift eigenfunctions. From finite field case to uh, to analytic, uh, and then uh, also there is a connection from analytic to geometric, which is that uh, these eigenfunctions are going to satisfy differential equations, which are uh, quantum Hitchin equations, uh, and which appear in the geometric language. Uh, of course, there is well-known connection here between the module and uh, and C shifts, which is just the geometric language, uh, which is just the Riemann Hilbert correspondence. Uh, and uh, also, uh, if you, uh, this version of the sheaf, uh, theoretic geometric language, if you take trace of Rabinus, there is connects to the arithmetic case. And finally, uh, the quantum field theory setting, as I mentioned, there is work of Kafuisman and Witten, which connects to geometric language, and work of Kayota Witten more recently that connects to this analytics. So this is just a brief uh, overview. And so now I, I want to uh, focus on the analytic language correspondence and I'm going to start with the case of field of complex numbers. So H is going to be uh, the Hilbert space L2 of Bungie of X of C. Uh, so this is a, a space of stable uh, bundles, which is a, algebraic variety, so in particular complex, this is going to be a complex manifold, and this is the space of a square integrable uh, 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 half densities on this manifold. Second. Uh, okay, and so uh, so in this space we have uh, uh, natural uh, commuting operators, uh, which are KK operators. Uh, 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 they uh, were discussed yesterday by Sasha, and uh, such operators are uh, labeled by a point on the curve, uh, X and X or C, and uh, by a uh, uh, co-way of uh, our group uh, G, which is the same as a dominant way of uh, G chair. And uh, these operators satisfy uh, this equation, HX lambda HX mu equals to HX lambda plus mu. Note that this is different from the equation satisfied by Hick operators in the uh, usual arithmetic language where uh, the multiplication law is the same as in the representation category of G check. So this means that when you leave from characteristic uh, from finite field to local field, there will be some transition matrix, uh, which is actually not quite known. This is what Sasha talked about, which will transform this trivial multiplication rule to the non-trivial multiplication rule, uh, which is a tensor product of representation. Okay, and so. Uh, uh, and these operators are uh, conjecturally uh, compact normal operators. Uh, so they are compact and they commute with their adjoint. And for this reason, they will have discrete spectrum by standard theorem and elementary functional analysis. I, I don't really know how to ask this right, but this equation you have about how the operators compose. Why is it not alarming? Or do you have some conceptual explanation for what's going on? I kind of talked about this yesterday. The answer is no. That's, <laughs> but, uh, and that, that's the fundamental, especially in the kind of non Archimedean case, that's sort of the fundamental problem. We don't really understand what where this hack operators come from. What no, no, no. form, so to say. 
No, 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 there is, there is a, there is some explanation. Maybe you will not call it an explanation. But it didn't work by the algebraic apparatus. I think there should, should have simplification, but it will not as straightforward as. No, so, so, so why? Uh, so let me give some explanation, which is going to be very elementary, and maybe you will not call it an explanation. But uh, the explanation is the following. So when we compose state operators, what we are doing is we are, we, are kind of, um, we are composing some correspondences, corresponding to some cells in the affine grass mind. Now, uh, uh, so that means that we're basically taking some product of, of cells, and then we decompose it also into pieces. And the summons in the formula correspond to, to the pieces. Now, one of those pieces will have the largest dimension, others will have smaller dimension. Over a finite field, all of these will contribute. But over local fields, the, all of them except the biggest dimension will have measure zero. And so they don't contribute. This is called proof. This is not called this. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, I, and the picture you just described, do you, do you use the word cells? Is this, maybe you can just make some kind of comment about this, but the, the pieces of the Osmanian or an algebraic geometer are not. I mean, they're not an. Or no, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean piece. I meant pieces. But, yeah. Uh, so you meant pieces, but uh, that would be part of. I don't know. I I share a confusion with Sam that like. Okay, so I, I agree. Maybe the leading term is all that contributes. But why are why is the geometry of these kind of leading terms additive if they're not? Because it's yeah. very, very rational in this world. Yes, it's just product. So, so the biggest it's piece it's yeah. of lambda plus mu is just a product of the piece for lambda. If I see a flag variety, I may as well just replace it with the open cells. Yes, and yes. And then yes. I'll never see it. Yes, yes. And that's a kind of, sorry, is that a kind of a universal ideology in this game? Or is that good? <laughs> Yes, yes, but uh, okay, so but then you have to pay at certain places, you have to pay for this uh, kind of uh, oversimplification. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, and then uh, uh, so then there is another uh, uh, then there is another thing which is quantum kitchen system, which uh, uh also acts on this Hilbert space, but it, uh, but this, in this case, uh, these are conjecturally unbounded normal operators. So uh, um, they do not actually, uh, are not defined on the whole Hilbert space, but they are defined on some dense subspace as a differential operator usually will be. And uh, both types of operators uh, are defined uh, uh, using the representation of one G in terms of the loop group. So let us recall uh, this. Uh, presentation. Uh, so for this purpose, I'm going to assume for a moment that G is semi-simple, and this is not essential. Uh, uh, in this case, uh, by Greenfield Simpson theorem, uh, any G bundle will get trivialized as soon as you remove one point. And uh, then uh, this means that you can glue it out of two charts. Uh, one chart is uh, the curve without that point, and the other chart is uh, uh, just the formal neighborhood of that point. And uh, this uh, gives you the following representation of one G of X uh, as uh, over your field as a double quotient. So you have this uh, loop uh, group uh, and you quotient it by uh, G of the Taylor series on one side and over G of uh, rational functions on X with all only at this point on the other side. Well, simply because you're gluing out of two charts. And so the clutching map is an element of the G of K. And uh, you, you can modify it on the right by an automorphism of the trivial bundle on the disk, and on the left by an automorphism of trivial bundle on X minus six. OK. All right. So. Uh, So this is what I already explained. Uh, and, and then uh, what is quantum Hitchin system? Uh, so uh, this is obtained uh, as follows. So uh, we can take uh, enveloping algebra of G hat uh, at the critical level. So central charge equals to minus dual Hoxter number. Uh, 
for simple uh, groups. Uh, some completion of this has a big center, uh, which is called the Kagan Triangle Center. Uh, and uh, uh, for geomodulism two, this is very easy to define with the so called Sugawara operators. It's uh, more difficult to uh, obtain them for other higher energy algebras. Uh, but still, uh, we can uh, view uh, these as differential operators. Well, they're elements of self completion. So with, uh, you can view them as differential operators of a kind on the loop group. And then uh, since they are two central elements of the enveloping algebra, they are not only left invariant differential operators, but also right invariant. And therefore they can be descended to the double quotient. And uh, because uh, this only exists at critical level, uh, you will get differential operators on the double quotient, but not uh, on functions, but actually on half densities exactly, because that's what the critical level condition tells you. Uh, and uh, so, uh, so that's exactly what this anomaly uh, gives. Uh, and Uh, and then uh, I uh, will explain what are KK operators. So uh, to define KK operators, you need to use a fine grass minor, which I already mentioned in response to Sam's question. Uh, so this is a one-sided portion, G of K or G of O, so it's a local object. And uh, uh, then uh, uh, this carries an action of G of O on the left, uh, whose orbits are the G G G lambda parameterized by uh, co weights. Uh, and these are finite dimensional uh, varieties. And then we have a convolution action. Uh, if you have a half density on uh, bond G, which is the double quotient, uh, then uh, if you also have a G of O invariant distribution of, on G of K mod G of O, uh, which is a, essentially distribution on G of K double quotient G of O, then you can convolve them and you obtain, uh, uh, again, uh, uh, a half density on bond G of S. And the Hick operator is defined exactly in this way. That H x lambda psi is a psi convolved with the delta function of uh, this uh, GER G lambda. Of course, this raises all kinds of questions. What do you mean by delta function? Does it actually have an appropriate measure? And so on. And the answer is yes. So this is actually implicit, like Sasha said in their paper with Kajdan in 2007, and was spelled out also by Pellinson and Dreyfus. So it, it thinks exactly uh, work out uh, the way that this makes sense. Uh, so uh, so this integral uh, over uh, Gurdjie lambda uh, makes sense uh, in the sense that what we are integrating is indeed the measure. It's not completely trivial to see, but one can do it. And uh, for example, uh, let me explicitly describe this operator in the case of G equals to PGL2. Uh, well, in this case, uh, uh, bond G of X is a, uh, well, GL2 bundles are just rank two vector bundles, and PGL2 bundles are rank two vector bundles modulo tensoring with line one. And I'm going to consider the simplest situation where our weight lambda is one. So, so G is PGL2, so the Langlands dual group GTF is SL2. And uh, its uh, highest uh, weights, which are co-weights for G, are just non-negative integers. So uh, in particular, the simplest case is lambda equal one. And we know that that's enough because everything else is obtained as a product. So in this case, this GER G lambda, uh, which is the closure of uh, the corresponding piece, is P1. Uh, and so uh, uh, for every S, in uh, so the, the, the way uh, if you unravel the definition, what you get is the following that if you take S, which is in the proxy projectivization of the fiber of this bundle at X, 
Note that this is a but fiber is only defined up to scaling because uh, this is a uh, rank two bundles up to uh, tensoring with line bundles. But projectivization is canonically defined. And uh, then uh, you do uh, the following operation, very important operation, which is called KK modification of E at X uh, using S. It is denoted in this way. And uh, this is a new uh, bundle. Uh, well, you construct it as a vector bundle. You, you choose uh, a representative of the vector bundle and construct it also as a vector bundle in regard to modular line bundles. So it's a bundle whose local sections are sections of E with at worst first order pole at X and residue in S. Again, residue literally only makes sense for one forms, but we are only interested in residue modular scaling and that's defined for any line bundle. Or any vector bundle. So, so then uh, this KK operator is uh, defined by the uh, the following formula: uh, H X psi of E. So, by definition, this is the integral over this uh, projective line P one of E X of psi of the KK modification D S. And again, this ds is a certain canonical measure, which, uh, which is defined, and this is uh, exactly, exactly what I explained before. Uh, there is also a variant of this, which is the ramified case. And uh, it's important because uh, uh, this, uh, as I said, we have to have some stable bundles. So in genus zero and one, if you don't have functions, you do not have any stable bundles. But the only, uh, but the high genus case is much more complicated. So actually, what we can actually prove, many things that we can prove, only we proved in genus zero and one, uh, one for my, my student, Daniel Kluwer. Uh, but for that, you need to make functions. And so if you have T1 through Tn and X, uh, which are distinct, well, at the moment, let us assume that they're defined over my original field. Uh, uh, and, uh, I, I can then consider the space B bond G of X T1 Tn, which is the modular space of G bundles on X with trivialization at these points. And then, uh, and that's an interesting thing, you get a new kind of input into the theory, which is uh, unitary representations of uh, your group G, in this case, complex group G, uh, uh, which you would put in these points. And uh, well, then, uh, so you have an action of G to the N on this uh, manifold, uh, which just changes the realizations at the point C1, Cn. And then you can define a Hilbert space bundle uh, on uh, bond G, um, uh, which is the following. So if you quotient bond G X C1, Cn by G to the N, you get bond G. But now let me take a product over G to the N of the tensor product of these representations. In other words, it's a direct product modular the diagonal action. So that's a Hilbert space bundle, infinite dimensional vector bundle. And now if you have a Hilbert space bundle on any manifold, you can also define uh, square integral half densities with values in this bundle. And that's what I'm going to do. So this is going to be my Hilbert space. Uh, and uh, so in this case, uh, we still can write kitchen operators and KK operators. Uh, KK operators will be for points different from TI. And another thing you can do, which is important also, is that you can consider uh, uh, TIs, uh, well, I will, uh, at the moment, uh, in the complex numbers, it doesn't matter, but when I talk over non-closed field, over non-algebraically closed fields, you can take divisors, which are as in their entirety defined over the original field, but the uh, individual points are not. So the complex case, this is, of course, irrelevant. So here is an explicit example. I'm going to write down an explicit formula. So X is going to be P1, genus zero curve, and I will have M plus two points, T1 through Tm plus one. In this case, my Hilbert space uh, 
Well, it's going to be uh, my bond uh, is graded by uh, uh, by degree of my bundle, which which is an element of pi one, uh, and so uh, and then uh, uh, the pieces that I will get are uh, going to be just multiplicity spaces of this representation into this tensor product. It's a tricky object to define, but uh, if they are tempered representations, you can do that. And uh, so for example, when g equal to pgl2, which is the case I will consider, I can take pi j to be the principal series representations, unitary principal series, which are tempered. So this means representations v lambda is the real part of lambda is minus one. Uh, and then uh, I also have H splits into direct sum of two pieces corresponding to bundles of degree even and odd. Uh, and so uh, then uh, H0 can actually be interpreted as the space of translation invariant uh, homogeneous functions on uh, C to the M plus one of this degree. So you can just parameterize things Basically, you can consider uh, just the trivial bundle and parabolic structures will be determined by some complex numbers. So it's going to be a function and uh, you will get homogeneous functions, translation invariant of this degree on this vector space. And the H1 is going to be similarly homogeneous functions of this degree. And, and then the Hecke operator uh, Hx will act from H0 to H1 and also from H1 to H0. Uh, and uh, it's given by the following explicit formula, like the, down to the level of calculus. So Hx psi is equal to the integral of psi of this thing times some weight, which is this thing here, ds, ds bar. So this is the integral over the complex numbers. Okay, so now, any questions? Okay, so we want to parameterize eigenvectors of H, uh, X and the kitchen algebras A and A bar, which act uh, on my Hilbert space. And uh, let us recall for this purpose that the spectrum of the kitchen algebra is uh, the set of G check orders of X, it's a theorem of Balenson and Drinfeld. And uh, this is a certain affine space. Well, at least if your group is uh, adjoint, I think so, uh, or maybe simply connected. Anyway, so uh, eigenvectors are parameterized by authors. So the conjecture is that eigenvectors, so eigenvectors will definitely be parameterized by authors because they are. Uh, characters of my algebra, but uh, uh, the conjecture is that eigenvalues uh, of, of these operators are parameterized by G check authors uh, uh, with a real monodromy. Uh, that's uh, the main point in the complex theory. Me real monodromy means that the monodromy representation pi one of x to G check uh, can be conjugated into the split form of uh, G check over the reals. And uh, so in the ramified case, uh, when I have punctures, uh, same tamely ramified case, uh, by the way, there is also a wildly ramified case, but I'm not gonna talk about it. Uh, you can also do stuff in the wildly ramified case. But anyway, uh, but in that case, the stocks data will have to play a role. Uh, so uh, authors have regular singularities at TI, uh, with prescribed uh, residues, uh, and uh, uh, the residues are the parameters of my representations. They're determined by the parameters of the representation. So let me remind what authors are briefly. So, uh, so recall it uh, in, on my term x. Wait, does that mean the Langlands parameters of the, what, what sort of parameters of the representations? That yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, in particular, in the example, they are the, these uh, parameters lambda i corresponding to the principal series. Yes, but in general, it's well, in general, Langmans parameters, and uh, I don't actually. It's complicated to say what condition on authors. <laughs> I mean, it's uh, 
only only very simple cases of this have been worked out. So how Langland's parameters translate into the precise condition for authors uh, is not quite clear in complicated cases. So uh, can I ask another question too? So just in the unramified case, do you, do you have a formula and you just uh, conjectural for what the eigenvalues of these AK operators should be? Yeah, it should be a solution of the author. So, so, uh, so there is this author corresponding to the K cap. Actually, like the actual get written. So that's just yes. Yeah, yeah. So the author how to write. So, so, so the conjecture is you should, you have to write down the differential equation corresponding to this author, and uh, and then uh, you have to uh, so author uh, so this is going to be a section of uh, some bundle. And uh, this is a holomorphic function, but which will branch, or I not branch, but have monodromy around the curve. But then there is uh, also anti holomorphic water, which is complex conjugate of that, uh, which will have a solutions that are anti holomorphic. And then real monodromy will exactly mean that there is a way to pair them in such a way that the function you will get is single value, real analytic single value function. That will be the eigenvalue. Uh, uh, also, order. Um, Order uh, can bundle is irreducible, which means that there will be only one such thing up to scale. Wait, I feel like I'm, I'm not understanding something. So, so you're saying whenever you have one of these operators with real monodromy, you're supposed to have some canonical function on fun G attached to it, and it's supposed no, to uh, uh, wait, well, yeah. be about the function. No, no, for so that, that function, there is no foregone. I mean, there is a no, formula. That's actually not my question. But then you're saying it's an eigenfunction for the Hecke operators. Yes. And I'm wondering, what is that? If you just plug in the eigen the Hecke operator h x lambda. What is the eigenvalue supposed to be as a function of? Yeah, yeah. So I'm describing that. Well, let me describe the answer when, let's say, g equals g and p g and two, and uh, uh, lambda equals uh, one. So, so in this case, you have order is a second order differential operator like d squared plus u, and, and then you write this differential equation. And uh, this differential and the, the complex conjugate equation. And this has a unique, if monodromy is real, then this has a unique up to scaling solution beta, which is a real analytic function, x, x bar, and which is single value. Then there is an issue of normalizing this function, which is non-trivial. Why is it single valued? So monodromy, so so suppose you have so you have monodromy phi one of x into SL2 R. This is the same as SU11. And so that means that there is a Hermitian form of signature one one that is invariant under monodromy. So you take the uh, combination of holomorphic and anti-holomorphic solution corresponding to that form. And so the value of this function at x will be the eigenvalue. Yes. And well, well, except that it is not well defined yet because we have it's defined up to scaling. So we have to set scaling, and that's a non-trivial business. Okay. But and, and maybe you don't have to answer in detail, but is, is there an answer for every x and every lambda and every g? We'll yes, but, yes, so there, there is a, uh, yes, there is a similar answer for every x, every lambda, and every g. So basically you have something that uh, yeah. is defined in a very similar way. But, but it's kind of conjectural, but in, in gene zero for pg2, we can prove that. And, and then this I, I mean, we can prove that given that analysis is done, which means we have compact self-adjoint degree. And this funny business about the additivity of Hecke operators earlier, is, is it reflected in the fact that- Yeah, yeah it's reflected in this fact. It's reflected, uh, as it called, there is this uh, thing. Uh, I have to recall, <laughs> this is something that Drink and uh, wrote down and never published. Uh, I, I, I will remember, <laughs> I forgot what it's called. <laughs> but it's a fact about representation theory. It's basically the fact that uh, if you want to specify uh, a, uh, 
a parallel subgroup. You should specify a vector in every representation uh, such that the tender product uh, is pretty sure. So, uh, okay. uh, uh, green fits blue calculations. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Uh, all right. So, uh, so reminder about authors. So I have uh, uh, x uh, from k to the minus. So this is going to be in genus bigger than one, uh, but uh, can be generalized. So x from k to the minus one half to k to one half is just h one of x k, which by its reality is h zero of x o star, and that's one dimensional trivial space c. Uh, so this means that there exists a unique non-trivial extension here, uh, and this is called the author bundle, and uh, this is an unstable SL2 bundle, and then uh, if you have any group, uh, then you can associate, uh, uh, then you can associate to, uh, uh, to this group, uh, you can associate a G-check bundle to this bundle using the principle homomorphism, uh, so then you get the so-called author bundle. And uh, uh, G-check author is just a connection on this bundle. Uh, and the above conjecture is mostly proved in our work with Frankel and Kajdan for PJ2 and for N equals to P1 with punctures. And finally, I got to the, to the real case probably won't be able to cover all of it. Uh, but let's consider the real case when F is the real field. Uh, so in this case, uh, there are several complications, which we want because they are similar to complications in the periodic case. Uh, coming from the fact that R is not algebraically closed. So recall that in this case, we have a curve S, which is a complex, still a complex Riemann surface. But it has a real structure, which, uh, which means that it has an anti-holomorphic involution tau from x to x. And uh, this involution may or may not have fixed points, uh, and they form ovals, which are circles on this curve. So it can look like this or like this, uh, or like this. So x of r is the union, disjoint union of these circles. Uh, and we should consider Heke or Hitchin operators on L2 of bungee of X of R. Uh, this is the space of real G bundle. But uh, we have to say what it means to have a real G bundle uh, with respect to that real structure. And to define uh, what this means, we should fix a real structure on G, uh, which is a class in H1 of uh, Z mod 2 with coefficients in automorphisms of G, uh, and uh, Z more two X by compact conjugation. Uh, and so then automorphism, let's say it acts by compact conjugation on our G, and then automorphism, so G is automorphism of delta G, semi direct product of the, with the adjoint group, and delta G is the root datum. And uh, it turns out that this notion of a real bundle in the moduli space only depends on the inner class of this uh, real structure. So let S be the image of sigma in the group H1 of Z2 automorphism. So the root datum, which is uh, the inner class. So, and then, uh, then it's easy to see that the notion of real bundle depends only on the inner class. And so for every S, you obtain a certain moduli space. And uh, now, if you have a bundle P, which is a point of the space, uh, then for every oval CI, uh, you get a real form of your group in the inner class S, which is actually an honest form now. So that's also easy to see. And, uh, and so, uh, uh, so therefore, uh, connected components, or maybe clusters of connected components, actually, I think in many cases, just connected components of this real uh, topological space uh, are parametrized by certain collections, sigma one through sigma n, 
but some of these might be empty. So for example, for PGA2, uh, we have only uh, one inner class, which, uh, uh, and there are two real forms, PGA2R and PU2. And uh, there are two types of ovals, therefore, real ovals on which there is a form PGA2R and quaternionic ovals on which there are form PU2. And, uh, uh, and finally, uh, if uh, we have uh, punctures, uh, for then uh, what should be the setup? So for points Ti, which, uh, so these points will come therefore in, uh, this should be defined over real. So this means some points are going to be real and some points are gonna come in complex conjugate pairs. That uh, becomes a lot more pronounced feature in the piadic case. So for complex conjugate pairs, uh, the point is of this local, so this means that we should, as before, fix a representation, unitary representation of the G of C. Uh, but if uh, uh, the points are on the real locus, then we need to fix a unitary representation pi i uh, of the real form uh, sitting on that uh, oval. And this defines as a Hilbert space and the spectral problem that we want to solve. And let me conjecturally describe the spectrum. So the first case is the case when there is no fixed points. Uh, and in this case, uh, I'm going to, so the, the answer is suggested in this case by uh, Gayota and Witten, uh, and it's, uh, we have checked that it indeed works, at least uh, data that they propose do give rise to eigenfunctions. Uh, sorry, the, it's the other way. Every eigen function gives a piece of, gives such a piece of data. We have not shown the other implication. But anyway, uh, in this case, uh, we can define the Langlands L group, uh, which is GL uh, Z mod two semi right product with G check and Z mod two X on G check by omega composed with S. Uh, where omega is the Cartan involution. That's a bit different from the definition in the theory of real groups, where one uses a different involution here. Um, uh, uses the involution defining real form, real split form. But there is a, there is a reason for it, which, which is basically that for gauge theory, the basic form is the compact form and not the split form. But, uh, but uh, let, me, let me skip that. Uh, otherwise, it is completely analogous. Uh, and conjecturally, the spectrum is parameterized by local systems. Uh, so in this case, we can define a quotient x mod tau, which is a non-orientable surface. And it has a fundamental group, which is uh, twice as big as the fundamental group of x. And we can consider homomorphisms from that in the GL. And the, these homomorphisms should uh, uh, satisfy the following condition. That first of all, the orientation re reversing paths should map to the non-trivial component of the Langland cell group. And also restriction to the orientation preserving parts uh, should be an author. So it's a, it's, a, it's a local system which has an author structure in the Durham world. And so this is what's suggested by Diode and Witten. And what we've shown is that spectrum is parameterized by, by a subset of this set. So uh, actually, uh, so that means that basically uh, every eigenfunction give rise to such an object. And maybe in the last five minutes, let me explain what happens when tau does have fixed points. That uh, actually more interesting and more complicated. So what should be the topological uh, condition? Uh, Okay, so let me just, all right. So then there, we have a topological condition on spectral authors, uh, uh, which depends on the form sigma i of g on each oval, even if we don't have punctures. So for example, let's consider uh, PGL2. Uh, and uh, in this case, we have real and quaternionic ovals, and consider the case when ovals are 
real, all of them, and the real locus cuts x into two pieces. So actually, it may not cut into two pieces, but uh, uh, for example, uh, there could be a torus with one circle on the top. But in this case, we have uh, the following uh, condition uh, on the monodromy uh, of this order. So, uh, so we have a monodromy from the upper part. So we have two parts in this case. And we have uh, I1 of the upper part, and this goes into SL2C. And one condition is that the monodromy around these cycles should be uniported for all I. And then the second condition, uh, that rho L length in SL2R up to conjugation. But it's only for the upper part. So in particular, it doesn't imply that the whole monodromy length in SL2R because it's a different problem. It's a different reality condition. So we will call the order satisfying this condition balanced. And the set of balanced orders, one can show that it has expected dimension zero. So basically, okay, you have to check it, but it's very likely just a discrete countable set. And uh, we expect uh, that it forms a discrete set and the theorem is that every order arising in the spectrum of state operators is balanced. Well, the converse, you, you need a couple more conditions actually, which cut out a smaller set from this countable set, but we have these conditions and we expect that the converse is true once you impose them. And finally, consider the case with punctures for x equals P1 and G equals to SL2 when you have a single quaternionic oval on P1 of R. And so in this case, we should uh, put a punctious unitary representation of the real form, which in this case is unitary group. And uh, so the real form will be just uh, some representations of uh, SU2. Uh, so uh, Hilbert space is going to be finite dimensional in this case. It's invariance in the tensor product. And quantum kitchen operators are the, uh, the Godin operators which are these operators familiar from statistical mechanics, where omega is this. This is the right-hand side of the fusion exomologic of equation. And then the spectral problem is the usual Gaudin model to diagonalize Gaudin Hamiltonians. So the topological condition on the author in this case is well known, and it is uh, that this author should be monodromy free. So we have trivial monodromy. Uh, and uh, so this was a, uh, so that we recover the result of, uh, uh, we don't reprove it, but we recover in the sense that it ends up being that result of Fagan, uh, Frenkel, and Rydnikov. So it was conjectured by Fagan and Frenkel and then two proved a few years later by Rydnikov that the spectrum of Gaudin operators uh, is parametrized by uh, uh, monodromy free orders of this form, where here you put uh, this is fixed, these are eigenvalues of local monodromies, and then the mu i are the three parameters here, uh, but they, they are subject to the condition that their sum is zero, rated at infinity should be this, and there should be free monodromy free. And the same happens for arbitrary g, there is an analog of that. So I think uh, in the last comment I want to make, is uh, that the take operators in this case is the so-called Boxer Q operator. Actually, Boxer Q operator hasn't been used much in the Gaudin model. It was more used in the Q deform story, uh, but actually it appears here. So I think I should stop because my time is up. Thank you very much.